ubiquitous in physics and science in general and in engineering and the model phenomena across the whole range of scales. So you can start with uh, computational chemistry at the, at the scale of the electron with the Schrodinger's equation and you go all the way through human scale to astrophysical scales and to cosmological scales. Now, yesterday we had a Nobel prize in cosmology essentially and Einstein's equation is a big player in that and uh, it's a PD. And uh, most PDEs, uh, almost all PDEs, it's very difficult to sort of find analytical solutions. So we have developed a whole toolkit of numerical methods. So these are like finite differences, finite volume, finite element. And these are very, very successful. But there are many PDEs or many aspects of PDEs for which these methods um, don't really work or they're not feasible or they're computationally prohibitively expensive. And one of these uh, classes of problems is when we look at PDEs in high dimensions. What do I mean by that? When the dimensionality, and this is, uh, I'll, I'll exp expand on that a bit more, is greater than four. So usually we are used to four dimensions, one space and three, uh, one time and three space dimensions. But there are large classes of PDEs which are set in state spaces, which are much bigger. For instance, if you think of the Boltzmann equation, so the distribution function is lives in six dimensions. Uh, in radiative transfer, in the most general case, where you have uh, polychromatic uh, time-dependent radiative transfer, you have seven dimensions. And then if you go to Schrodinger's equation in computational chemistry or Black-Scholes equation in computational finance, here the number of dimensions can be in the hundreds or the thousands, depending on the, on the applications. But in this uh, talk, uh, I do the deep learning in particular plays a big role in solving such PDEs. But uh, I have decided to sort of focus my talk on a different aspect, which is uh, when the dimensionality is somehow more implicit rather than being explicit. And these are parametric PDs. And to, they are also ubiquitous. Let me just motivate them by giving an example. Suppose you want to design a new aircraft, an efficient aircraft. More or less, the first step is to design efficient airfoils. These are wing sections. Uh, just for visualization purposes, I talk about 2D here. So the flow, so you can see this is the flow, there's a Mach number. Uh, this is um, modeled by the compressible oil or navier Stokes equations of fluid dynamics. And what I'm interested is in aerodynamic quantities, body forces like lift and drag, which are written here. And the point is that this flow has several parameters, right? Uh, for instance, the Mach number, the incident flow, angle of attack, the incident pressure, incident temperature, and so on. So these are all parameters. And these parameters, for instance, are not known exactly, you have to somehow measure them or infer them. So you can think of these parameters as representing the uncertainty that is inherent to any physical process. And these contribute to the pa parameters in a parametric PD. But these are not the only parameters. To design an airfoil, so you start with some sort of a reference airfoil, and then you parameterize the design space with some spline functions or some basis functions. And this is the so-called design envelope. You can have airfoils within this envelope uh, to, for instance, optimize drag or some minimize drag or something. And these are the design parameters, which are, can also be represented in terms of parametric PDs. So abstracting out a little bit, so just for notational purposes, I would say, I represent the parametric PDs in this sort of notation, where this guy here is a differential operator. Think of the Laplacian or the heat equation or something, or Navier-Stokes for that matter. Of course, the differential operator depends on just space and time. But the solution itself and the inputs to the PD, they depend on the parameter, uh, which could be the probability space that represents uh, uncertainty. It could be the design or control space uh, where you, the design or control parameters are represented. And so this is a sort of abstract form. And the goal of the computation is given a parameter, uh, for instance, shape variables, um, you have to evaluate or compute the whole field. Um, it's a function of space and time or you have to compute, for instance, observables. Remember like lift and drag. So observables typically are in this form, but uh, these are just functions or quantities of interest. So for each value of the parameter, you have a different value of the observable. The point is that for each draw of the parameter, and this is, the, this is somehow the key point, for each draw of the parameter, we can use finite volumes, finite elements, we can use HPC systems, and we can, we can solve the PD for each draw. It could be very expensive, sometimes extremely expensive. Uh, only the state-of-the-art HPC platforms will provide us the solution. But in principle, this is possible. 
But if you have to solve a design problem or uncertainty quantification problem or inverse problem, the point is one call is not enough. You have to make hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of calls to the PDE solver. And this is prohibitively expensive, even with 2D problems, certainly in 3D, this is prohibitively expensive. And what we are going to talk about today is that we are going to approximate these uh, fields or observables, which are functions of the parameter in by deep neural networks, a particular class of um, a particular class of machine learning paradigm, which is deep neural networks, and we'll see that. So can we do that? Means, uh, and we know that deep learning today is ubiquitous, right? It's everywhere, whether in machine translation or face recognition or also self-driving cars, autonomous vehicles, and so on. It's increasingly being used in scientific computing, and this is the context in which I'm going to talk today. So almost everyone knows what deep neural networks are. So just for notation, these are functions for me. So remember, my objective for simplicity, I focus on observables. They think of the lift and drag, and I'm going to approximate them by deep neural networks. So these are functions so which start with an input space, and then the function is pushed through different layers. Well, this is by now familiar. Each layer has very simple operations. So it's either the functions are either affine, so these are the so-called weights and biases, or you have scalar nonlinearities, the so-called activation functions. There's a whole zoo of activation functions. So what a neural network does is that it starts with the input and it pushes the function through or composes the function through the sequence of layers, and you obtain an output. And the way you do it is your objective. So remember that these theta here, which represents the weights and biases, these are somehow tuning parameters, which we, we, which we don't know, and we have to determine. To determine these tuning parameters, what we do is we train the neural network. So uh, what I mean by that is, okay, this is, uh, okay, I train the neural network, which means that what I do is I use a random training set. I take points, which are independent, identically distributed. And the idea is to minimize this sort of mismatch function. So this is the difference between your ground truth and the neural network. And this is this minimization problem is solved with some version of the stochastic gradient method. So once the training is complete, I have a surrogate or a substitute for my exact map. So this is the basic idea. The question is, can this be done in practice? Yes, in principle, as I said, it can be done because what you need is training data. And these training data will be generated usually by simulation. Sometimes they are augmented with uh, real data, but uh, usually with simulations. Could be expensive to generate them, but we generate them. And this is, um, we know that there are certified methods, uh, finite element of finite difference that is able to do that. But the question is, we want to interpolate, we want to find a trained neural network such that this error between the trained neural network and my underlying ground truth or the numerical approximation is going to be small. And there are theorems which uh, sort of guarantee that. Um, some of the people who have written these theorems are written here. But let me give you the punchline, the bottom line. The bottom line is if your function is uh, sufficiently smooth, uh, S here measures the smoothness of the function, then the approximation error can be controlled. In, and your, if your neural network has M parameters, so there is a very specific architecture. But let's say that we parameterize it by M parameters, weights and biases then the error behaves in the following manner. So it depends on the dimension of my input space uh, very badly, as you can see here. And it also depends on the smoothness. So if you have more smoothness, you, the error is going to be small. But unfortunately, uh, remember that even the, the solutions that I'm after, for instance, they have shock waves and so on. So these are not regular in any, by any means. They are rather bad. So this S here is typically one. So if S is one, and D is even moderate, let's say six dimensions, you have just six parameters, then to get an error of 1% from this net, from this sort of an estimate, which could be an overestimate, but this tells you this is impossible. You need a trillion parameter and uh, who, who is going to train such a network. So this kind of, this is sort of a pessimistic statement, right? Because uh, this tells you that it's expensive. And in fact, what it doesn't tell you anything about is it tells you that there exists a neural network with these properties but it doesn't tell you anything about the behavior of train networks. So this is sort of the most math heavy slide I have, but uh, that's about it. So if you want to compute or want to estimate the error of a train network, one tool which is used in statistical learning theory is what is called the bias variance decomposition. So remember that this is my error, some norm, you don't have to worry about the norm, 
My error, error is decomposed into three parts. So you have the first thing is so-called approximation error. Approximation error tells you is how close is your neural network approximations to your ground. So essentially this is the best approximation within the class of neural networks. And remember that this was very, very pessimistic before. But because we're solving PDEs, there is a lot more structure to these problems. And one can prove for variety of PDEs, including hyperbolic, nonlinear hyperbolic PDEs, that under certain conditions, uh, this is not so bad. You have a scaling, which is polynomial. This is typically one or two. So it, uh, of course, it grows, the error grows with dimension, uh, but it's not exploding with dimension. And it goes down with the number of parameters that you have. So there is some hope for approximation. Then we have something called generalization error. Because when we train, if you remember, we have to train with quantities like this, which are discrete quantities, like finitely many points, whereas your domain has infinitely many points. So the difference between them can be estimated by various means. But one estimate, uh, which uses essentially the central limit theorem, tells you that this is the scaling. So you have some, something which depends on the number of parameters and the number of training points. And then the last part, this is the hardest, in my opinion, uh, this optimization error. It's very difficult to estimate a priori because you're solving a very difficult, high dimensional, non convex optimization problem. But an upper bound on it is given in terms of what is called the training error, which is what you can compute during the training process. So the bottom line is if we have good approximation properties and if we have trained on the neural network well, for instance, by seeing that the training error which we compute is small, still my overall error does not behave very nicely. So what it behaves like is that uh, it is something which is dependent on the number of parameters. Let's say this is like order one or order 10. And then here on the other hand, we have a square root essentially, worse than a square root. So if you do the math to find an error of 1%, which is uh, sort of accuracy we look for, even if this is like order one, you still require something like the order of 10,000 training samples. Now, what's the challenge with that? Remember I told you my data is generated from um, numerical simulations. And it's expensive, right? To do 10,000 simulations is very, very expensive. And this is somehow the main message that I want to convey, that one can use machine learning methods uh, in the context of scientific computing. But the challenge that you have is that you have to learn maps of low regularity, because otherwise, if the map is smooth enough, you can do a much better job. But maps of low regularity and in a data poor regime, you don't have, you know, it's not like images or text or something where you have lots of data. Data is expensive here. And this is the whole point that here the data is not super big, it's sort of moderate or small. And how to uh, successfully do that, this is the challenge. And I'll give you a couple of ways uh, in which we are trying to circumvent this problem. So one way is, uh, and this I call it as a novel idea, it's, um, it's rather standard in, in a way, but let, let me talk about it, is that Okay, one of the advantages of doing scientific computing is that since we're generating our data with um, simulations, we can choose our training sets. And this is what is a key message here. So random points, which is the usual choice in machine learning is um, sort of spread out randomly, right? That's why there is no curse of dimensionality. What if I have a better spread out distribution of points? And this is precisely done by the so-called low discrepancy sequences. These are better spread out. So if you look at boxes here or uh, squares, each of them has a low discrepancy sequence very nearby, but many of these squares have no random points whatsoever. So these, uh, these points are weakly distributed, better distributed, and they're already known to numerical analysts from quasi Monte Carlo integrations. And if you take them as the training set, then in this paper, for instance, we prove that uh, total error is given in terms of what is called the training error. This is something that you compute and uh, something which depends on the number of training points. Of course, there are some constants here that are not important, but the number of training points is, uh, there's a logarithmic correction, but it is one over N. And what's good about that? Earlier, it was one over square root of N. So there's a big difference between square root of N and N. So we can do small data training, and this does work in practice. Here's a prototype just to give you an idea. So it's a seven dimensional problem. We are going to throw a ball so it's an ODE, but a nonlinear ODE with some uncertain drag parameters. And you want to calculate the trajectory. And you can see that with random points, uh, the error decays. So this is the number of points, it decays. It decays better than square root. It actually decays like minus 0 0.6, but with, uh, with this uh, low discrepancy sequence, 
it really decays at uh, one. So you have much better error at the same number of points. So this is one, one way you can do that. You can push this, for instance, for this aerodynamic design problem. So here is an example. So this is six dimensions, six design dimensions. So this is your low discrepancy sequence. Up here is your Monte Carlo, random, random points. So this is at 0 0.6. It's no longer one because the assumptions here are no longer satisfied. Because this required some smoothness assumptions which are no longer satisfied. But at least it's better than uh, one. And you can still see that there is a gap here. You can push this all the way up to 20 dimensions. Now the slope is still the same, but the constant is better. It's still a factor of five better, which is you take a factor of five if you can get it. Uh, you can remove this uh, logarithmic factor. If you remove, look at the estimate, you have the logarithmic factor. You can remove this logarithmic factor, but uh, then one has to pay a price. So for very specific type of maps, essentially analytic maps, which are also there, for instance, in elliptic and parabolic PDEs, you can remove this. Now you can show that the generalization gap, this error decays as uh, quadratic. So it's much better than Monte Carlo. And there's no curse of dimensionality anymore. In fact, this is an elliptic PDE, but it's a parameter detection problem. It's an elliptic PDE, and uh, you have 16 dimensions and 32 dimensions. And you can say that they both the error decays uh, as, a, as a quadratic. The rate of decay is going to be quadratic. So this is one way in which we can substantially reduce the amount of data that is necessary for these problems. Another way, which is very interesting, is based on what is called multi-level training. So multi-level training, what you do is, when we do numerical simulations, we don't always have one grid. We sometimes have a hierarchy of grids, or many times we have a hierarchy of grids. And the point is, on a coarse grid, we can generate a lot of samples cheaply. On a very fine grid, we have a very few samples, because otherwise it's very expensive. And the approximation of your underlying function is different accordingly. So it's uh, more approximation here, smaller approximation here, error, better approximation. And here you have, let's say, coarse approximation. And the idea is that instead of having one level of training, you decompose your ground truth into these uh, layers here, or um, let's say nested levels. And these are what are called details. And instead of training one neural network, you train essentially a hierarchy of neural networks, where instead of looking at the exact ground truth, you look at the errors between different grids. And there you can even prove that if the variance somehow decays, which it does for many, many simulations, then you'll get a speed up with the, with the training with respect to single level training. And this is also seen in practice. Again, uh, this plain vanilla problem, seven dimensional problem. Here you get speed ups like a factor of 20 sometimes, a factor of 15 sometimes, quite a good speed up. And even for the more complicated problem where you have lift and drag, you still get a factor of five sometimes or between three and six. And these ads, right? So you already had like five from the, from the quasi Monte Carlo training. And then if you get another five, it's a factor of 25, 30. And this makes your problem feasible. And we have applied this in numerous contexts. I will, in the remaining part of my talk, I'll give you some applications. Uh, one which I don't cover much is uncertainty quantification. This is already published some time back. The paper has been uh, appeared recently, but this is uh, at least a year old. So the idea is that you do uncertainty quantification, which it means that uh, you want the histograms, the probability distributions, for instance, of the lift and the drag, as you vary the parameters. And uh, this is done by using this uh, deep learning algorithm, where instead of doing the full simulation, we take 128 samples, train the neural network, and then compute these objects from the neural network. And you can see that there is a very good fit and over Monte Carlo, you get enormous speed up. You get like factor of 250 sometimes. And even over quasi Monte Carlo, which is a state of the art uncertainty quantification algorithm, you get a factor of seven to nine, which is nothing, which is considerable, one order of magnitude. And with this multi-level training, you can get another factor of five. So overall, you get a factor of about 50, which makes these kind of problems feasible, also in three dimensions. So this is one application. Another application that I am, I think would be very interesting for many of you is uh, optimization, constraint, PDE constraint optimization. So many times uh, optimization is you optimize a load or you optimize the drag or the lift, but the object that you're optimizing is a solution of a PDE or comes from the solution of a PDE. So if you use a standard optimization algorithm like BFGS or uh, something like the gradient descent, 
you have to do a lot of forward solves for the PD and this is expensive. So the simplest thing you can do is, okay, now this is observable. I have trained a neural network with the, with the process that I have just shown you. Why don't I just replace and use this for the optimization, the surrogate for the optimization. It turns out that this is not such a good idea because after all, we are after some maxima and minima of the function. Whereas the neural network has been trained uh, with points spread out in the whole domain. So it may not represent maxima and minima well. And in fact, one can show that uh, if you have convex cost functions, that indeed the decay of error is going to be algebraic and it's also dimensional dependent. So this is not a very good idea. And you can already see it in this example where I'm plotting the lift to drag ratio. This is a quantity that can be optimized. So this is the histogram. With the training, training, trained neural network, you never capture the area where you want, right? Because this is exact, sorry. This is exactly where you want to optimize and you never have any representation, any samples from there. So how are you going to do that? So to circumvent this problem, we proposed a very nice algorithm, which uh, has just been accepted today. So uh, it's, it's a very interesting algorithm. It is what is called an active learning algorithm. Let me just explain it pictorially because this is uh, sort of very easy to explain. So again, I'm looking for the same problem. Uh, this is just a toy example where I throw the ball and my target is to hit 15 meters. And the control variables that I have are the velocity, the release velocity and the angle. So the dynamics is completely given by ODEs. We can solve this um, at least very quickly with runge kuta methods, but let's see how this algorithm does. The point is that the maximizers, the optimizers, it's not unique, it's a non-convex problem. The optimizers are along this parabola. They sit along this parabola, but when you sample, like we do to train a neural network, let's say randomly or with Sobol points, then what you see are uh, points everywhere. And as you can see that this parabola is not very nicely represented. And this is the reason why using neural networks for optimization problems like this might be problematic. On the other hand, the algorithm that we have is very simple and very intuitive. So we start with a few random points. We have no knowledge in real problems. We don't have any knowledge of where the maxima is. So we start with a few random points. We train the neural network, which is an approximation of your real thing. And because the neural network is going to be much cheaper, we can run a standard run of the mill optimizer algorithm, particle, particle swarm optimization, BFGS, whatever. And then we find some approximate uh, maxima or minima in this case. And these guys, as you can see, so these are the new points, which are in orange. These are distributed in this case, uh, even within one iteration, they were along this well. And now these will be my new training points. So my training points would be the old training points plus things which approximate the extrema quite well. And I do it in an iterative manner. So now I go back, I train a new neural network with these training points, run the optimization algorithm, and then update my training points. So now you can see that I fill up more of this uh, parabola, and this is an active learning algorithm. So I ask the, the learner, in this case, the neural networks, ask the teacher, in this case, the optimization algorithm to give them new points, in third iteration, you see you're starting to fill up the optima and in the fourth iteration, you really fill it up. So this, this works. And in fact, you can even prove, of course, with some hypothesis that now the decay is going to be exponential. So earlier, this was just algebraic. You can see this K was outside. Now the K is in the exponent. The K is the number of iterations. So very quickly, you can, uh, you can converge to minima. And this works, so we have prototyped it on, uh, on aerodynamic shape optimization problem where you minimize the drag for constant lift. And as you can see, we got 50% drag reduction, which is, um, which is considerable. The optimized shapes are very small perturbations, but this is the design space is rather constrained. And you can see that uh, in this case, the DNN optimization, the standard algorithm also didn't do so badly. But still, we have much faster decay and smaller variances, so not very sensitive. And if you take a black box algorithm, TNC in this case, you can see that also it gets the 50% drag reduction, but it takes about approximately 2,000 or 3,000 iterations to get there. And the deep neural network gets there with just 100, 100 evaluations of the map. So this is uh, why this is such a good option. So you get a speed up or 70 in this case, so you get a speed up of approximately 30 to 40, which is again, a significant uh, speed up. 
So it can be employed for these problems. And I'll finish with my last application, which is uh, another similar application, but for a different problem. And this is for the tsunami early warning system. And the tsunami early warning system is in the Mediterranean at least, what they do is whenever there's an earthquake, then immediately the code starts running. There is a production code. And there are also measurements which are available at different buoys, different locations. And they look at the time series and they issue a warning. So the point at the moment is that uh, the tsunamis are generated by earthquakes. This entire thing is modeled by a version of shallow water equations. And there are nine parameters. I can't, uh, I can't really hear. Okay, let's, uh, let me just continue. You can ask a question. My talk is almost uh, getting over. So let, let me just continue here. So the point is the initial conditions are generated by something called the Okada model, which uh, puts the parameters of the earthquake and produces the initial conditions. It has nine model parameters and you can do a simulation with a very efficient code, but it's still expensive, right? And we want to learn this with a neural network. And the point is you can do that. Uh, this is much cheaper than the code. You'll see the timings in a bit. And we learn, in this case, we have to learn a whole time series, not just one number, okay? So we have equally spaced points in uh, time. We have Sobol points and we do a very good job. There are lots of, the network is large. So it is 25,000 parameters. For the airfoil, we are just a thousand parameters because we have more data in this case. Nevertheless, we get errors like 2%, 2 to 3%. On an average, okay, the best errors are like one percent, and in fact, you can see that the time series is predicted almost exactly. These are the, this is at one buoy, and these are different uh, realizations or different samples, and uh, the exact solution is completely hidden by the neural network. You can't even see it. At another buoy, it's uh, very similar. So you do a very good job with a few data points, and I will finish by just making a quick summary that today I spoke about uh, the use of deep learning in computing parametric PDEs, particularly in the context of observables, but also fields. And the challenge is always to learn maps, which are complicated, low regularity somehow, in a data poor regime. Otherwise, uh, you need too many simulations. And by using novel training ideas like active learning and so on, we were able to, and also with the low discrepancy sequences, we are able to apply this effectively in many, many situations. And this can be applied in many, many other situations. This is a rather black box algorithm. And the bottom line is that uh, if I would have used my flow solver, so this is the mesh here, and this is the result of the flow solver. A single simulation is uh, about seven hours of wall clock time. It's of course parallelized, but it's still seven hours of wall clock time in 2D. So you can imagine in 3D what the costs are. Uh, by uh, with 128 training samples. The training time is between 10 and 15 minutes, nothing compared to generating one single sample. And then the evaluation time for the neural networks, these are rather small networks. This is like 10 to the power minus five seconds, so nothing. And the error is about one to 2%. So it really works in, in this particular regimes. And uh, one has to use some innovative ideas in order to get there, but it can be done. So I think uh, I am more or less exhausted with my time. So I, I would stop here and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Siddhartha, for your talk. Um, let us open it up um, for questions and a discussion. So there is, okay, I see there is a, a question in the chat yeah. from Ilya. You want uh, to read it or? I can read it, yeah. Did you verify your 50% drag optimization in airfoil case using control CFD run with final design? Yes. And did the final error converge to sub 1% error? Uh, yes, uh, indeed, uh, this was the case that the final design was uh, done with a CFD simulation and the error was less than 1% for the lift and the drag. For both lift and the drag, it was less than 1%. So it was actually less than this particular case. Indeed, it was done, done with that. Further questions from the audience? Also, also feel free to unmute yourself and ask the question. 
if if you give me if there are uh, the questions are slow in coming if you give me uh, because in my abstract i had also promised something about unsupervised learning i have a couple of slides and i can quickly show them is that okay that's fine yeah please do yeah, that so while so some far, questions are coming in uh, okay i can take the questions first or maybe i just uh, give you a couple of slides about yeah. unsupervised learning because sure. what i did so far was uh, supervised learning right because you give data and of course, uh, not a lot of data. You have to be careful how you give the data and then things work. But in my abstract, I said that uh, I will also talk a little bit about unsupervised learning. And very quickly, I have two slides on that. Now, this approach that I presented only works if you have for each draw or each sample a good solver. Expensive, perhaps, but it's there. But now, if you take Boltzmann or radiative transfer and so on, a single sample is uh, very, very expensive because the number of dimensions really goes up. So supervised learning may not work in these regimes, and one has to use some sort of unsupervised learning. And one sort of unsupervised learning that we, we try is something called physics-informed neural networks. This is very much in vogue these days. Has been there for some time, but uh, of late it has been really renovated and uh, revitalized by Kanya Dakis and his group. And we have provided some theoretical justification and focused on the sort of high dimensional applications. I'm not going to, uh, very quickly, the idea is very, very simple. So here you have the PDE and you want to find neural network which approximates the PDE. Forget about the details here. The point is you have something called the PDE residual which is obtained directly by back propagation, automatic differentiation. You plug it into the PDE. Of course, this is not going to be zero. And the idea behind pins is simply to minimize this residual or discrete version of this residual which is done with quadrature points. And in fact, you can even prove uh, rigorously, this is what we have done, that this works and it has very, very nice properties, at least for a very large class of PDs, not for all PDs. And there are many, many cool applications. One of the applications is that you can really solve high dimensional problems. Uh, this is a bit synthetic, uh, still a toy model, is the heat equation. Uh, and we use random training points. And you can see that we can go all the way from one to a hundred dimensions. Here, I don't have any data except the initial and boundary data no data in the interior of the domain, I can solve 100 dimensional problems with two and a half percent error. And these networks are not very big. So at least the, it doesn't explore the curse of dimensionality. It's just uh, linear growth, which is uh, always the case. And you can also do, for instance, radiative transfer, which is a much uh, harder problem. And here, for instance, it's a two dimensional problem, uh, one, one space variable and one angle. Uh, the deep neural network has 5,000 parameters. And we get an error of 0.5% in one hour. What's the big deal? You can also do that in finite elements much faster. The big deal is the next problem here. So now it's a six dimensional problem. So you have three space dimensions, a two angle and one frequency. And here also you solve it uh, a little more error, 2%, but you do it in one hour. So this is, uh, this is the beauty of these approaches, right? That there's no curse of dimensionality. So it's completely unsupervised and it works very well for a large class of problems, not for every problem. So I had sort of promised this. That's why I wanted to show this. And thank you very much for giving me this two, three minutes extra. <laughs> sure. Let me maybe start with a question on what you just presented. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm curious. Um, so at the beginning of your talk, you showed um, these estimates of how much training data, for example, do mm -hmm. you need to reduce the error? Mm -hmm. So I, I might have missed that, but for the pins, do you can you uh, prove Yes. Similar things? yes, but here you don't need any training data. Here the training data is very different. The training data are collocation points at which you collocate the residual. Okay, so here you just calculate the residual. This is uh, right here. You calculate the residual. So then you form this sum. Uh, this is like a quadrature. And then you just minimize this object here. Of course, there is initial and boundary data. This is, uh, you have to give that, right? But uh, so these points are not, in, you're not giving data. You're simply forcing your residual at these points. Mm -hmm. And we, we have proofs which say that, of course, there are certain conditions. Uh, mathematics, you always have some hypothesis, but these are non-trivial hypotheses. For instance, uh, this is verified for laminar flow, not for turbulent flow in very high Reynolds number. But for laminar flow, for instance, you can prove rigorously that the whole thing works. You know, so. Yeah. You, the, the error decays with the number of training points. Mm -hmm. You don't give any data as such, except the initial and boundary data. 
Thank you. There is something in the chat. Um, Ilya is asking, do you have um, a GitLab repository with your models and code? Yes. And, yeah. All of it. All of it. You can just go to. Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm very bad at showing references. But what you can do is you can just uh, go to archive, uh, put my full name, then you'll get all the papers uh, that are there, and each paper has uh, GitLab repositories uh, attached to what is uh, what is there, so people can play around with both pins as well as with supervised learning deep neural networks. So all the all the all the data is public. Very much. What is not public is sometimes the codes with which you generate the data. You know, this is uh, sometimes you've taken someone else's code or some in-house codes. These have not been well documented, but uh, the ones the given, I think in all, with all our in-house code is open, but sometimes we've used some code from NASA and then it becomes very difficult. But the neural network bits of it are all open, open source. Okay, another question. Uh, does this work with stiff equations? Stiff, uh, yes. Uh, what do you want with stiff? For instance, supervised learning works perfectly with stiff equations. Uh, in fact, uh, I have an example where uh, it's a stiff ODE. And uh, if, because the stiffness somehow, of course, you have to give an accurate solver, which handles the stiffness uh, at the sample points, right? You are, you're going to some, just imagine you have a stiff ODE, and it's uh, there is a parameter which uh, but for each draw if you have a good stiff solver then the neural network will very nicely interpolate does the pin work for stiff problems uh, probably i haven't really tried i think other people have tried and yes it does i don't think stiffness is a big issue because you st the point is that when you give data uh, the, you have to give data from a stiff solver, right? For at least for the supervised, uh, a solver that can deal with stiffness. So it doesn't tell you that uh, if I don't get data from a stiff solver, I can do something, right? So this, this is the whole point. So yes, it works for stiff mm -hmm. problems. It works for instance, Euler equations with chemistry uh, rather nicely. Thank you. Um, more questions from the audience? I don't see any. Ah, okay, oh. there's one. Ulrich uh, Günther is asking, did you encounter problems so far where your approach did not work or where the amount of training data necessary was too large? This is a very, very good question. And uh, maybe I can, can I share my screen again, please? <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yes, because- one Second, uh, yeah. I think now you should be able to. Yeah, because this allowed me to, it's a very, very good question. Means uh, how does the data, where is the, uh, have I shared my screen now? I'm still, am I able to share? I, so I I'm still not able to share the screen. You're not able, you should be no, able to. Okay, now, yeah. yes, yes, okay. okay, now I see. Perfect. You ask a very good question. For instance, this is an example, right? So earlier, I had like 100 points, 128 points, as you can see already with um, 80 points, I'm getting a very, very good answer, right? Now, here is an example where I have uh, the needs are different. Now it's not just one number like the lift or the drag that I'm learning, but I have to learn the whole time series, right? So here, uh, the question itself is uh, much more challenging. Oh, here Siddhartha, I, yes. this, your screen is not showing up. Um, really? Oh. This is strange. But I'm still not Sorry. able to share screen, so. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Let's see, Philip, can you help? I, I actually yeah. did what I could. Normally you should be able to do that now because mm -hmm. I actually put myself yeah, out. It was sort of working. Maybe you can make me a co-host again or something, no? And then yes. it will work fine. My apologies for this, but it is much easier to explain this if my screen is there. Sure, let's try if it's. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have to be a good sport about this. Uh... Okay, okay, uh, let, let, me, let me try to answer because otherwise we reach no. Okay. So uh, if you remember in the case for the tsunami predictions, 
there i had to learn a whole time series right so there by you it was not enough with just uh, 128 points i actually needed uh, more data points i needed a 1024 uh, points so and the reason is it depends on the variance you can reduce the variance but uh, there is it's still sort of dominated by the variance in your problem right if the problem has a lot of variance then you cannot uh, you have to the estimates were very clear in that there was a variance on top and the square root of m or uh, m or uh, n is the number of training points square root of n or n or n to the n squared but so it depends on the problem some problems you need more data some problems you need less data the ball uh, sort of the measure is look at the variance in your problem how much sensitivity is there if there's a lot of sensitivity of course you need more data is also so yes uh, in that case you do need more data but yet uh, this was a on you know uh, there is a tsunami is not happening every day so we we can train with lots of data and then when uh, for for prediction purposes this uh, this is very good whereas for uncertainty quantification or shape optimization purposes then more data is a bad thing but so far in these problems it's uh, you don't have so much of spread right because you're searching in small design spaces so the variance is somehow by the nature of the problem relatively small so yes uh, so you need more data in certain problems you can't solve it always by five data points or something i hope that answers you. your question We have more time for questions or comments as well. And just maybe I make a quick comment since you asked this question about data. One of the advantages of pins is that uh, they don't work always. You, we still don't know how they're going to work for a hypersonic compressible flow or something. But when they work, uh, you don't need, uh, for instance, in the solution of inverse problems, you don't need a lot of data. for pins because in addition to the data you also provide the pde so there is some implicit regularization happening at the level of pdes so we, we you don't need a lot of if you look at my papers or for instance papers of george kanyadakis they're able to find things out with very very few data points 10 10 measurements or something they are able to able to do this so pins provide you an additional way in which you can reduce the amount of data but at the moment pins are not uh, working for compressible flow that well so you can't use them without data you know so this, this is this is the, not for every problem yet but you know this just started so <laughs> um do you small like a question on uh, do you in either in supervised learning or unsupervised learning it's more like a personal question what what do you think are challenging problems interesting problems uh in supervised learning the interesting problem is uh, to get away with less data right It means uh, and to really get away with uh, less data and uh, and to understand uh, when it, you see these estimates that i showed you they look very nice but they were over estimates they still told you that you need a big neural network they didn't tell you that you need a trillion uh, a neural network of size trillion but they told you that you needed a neural network of size 60000 but in practice a uh, neural network of size 600 worked very very well and uh, to understand the nature of the training process so the stochastic gradient no one knows this right and this is sort of a uh, to understand the local minima that you get whether they are good enough or not at the moment we use training errors as sort of a substitute but maybe one should include some information about the weights and so on so in supervised learning there are still issues and using it in an efficient manner right because uh, if i just use supervised learning for optimization it didn't work so you had to use a modification of that similarly we see the same for bayesian inverse problems uh, variational for bayesian statistics you need to make small changes for unsupervised learning this is a um, enormously rich area because uh, there you don't need grids you don't need uh, <laughs> you, you know you you and there but at the moment we cannot do this for every equation you know, this is really new right it's uh, it's like a couple mm -hmm. of years old and only the first theoretical results are coming out 
So I am sort of uh, looking forward to be able to use this unsupervised learning machinery, for instance, for uh, solving compressible flow in 3D that uh, I do with my finite volume methods uh, with HPC, which take, you know, uh, 100,000 node hours or a million node hours. Can I reduce that? That's, that's, that's the challenge. Mm -hmm. There was a question, I think, by someone. Yes, um, Omar is asking, could you please elaborate a bit on why pins don't work in certain applications yes, uh, very well? Uh, yes, that's a very, very good question, Omar. Uh, again, if I, it would have been easiest if I could have shared this. Maybe now I can, no, I still can't share this thing. But uh, if you remember, I had uh, put in the residual, right? So the PD is residual, and I've used a strong residual for the PD. Now just imagine that you have a flow around an aircraft. Uh, this is the shocks and so on. And there the strong residual is not well defined for the exact solution. Of course, for a pin, uh, if you have smooth enough activation functions, everything is well defined. But uh, since the strong residual for the exact PDE is not well defined, you cannot expect that there will be a good, because the, the way pins work is that the residual has to approximate your error somehow. You have an error. And if the residual estimates your error, then the pin works. And I have a theory about that. But unfortunately, for these kind of problems, compressible flow, where there is not enough smoothness in the solution, or maybe too many scales, then you, so far, the strong version of pins, of the pin residual, they don't control the error. There is no co correspondence between them. You need a weak version of it. But now to train that is not trivial. It requires some adversarial training. We are very much working on this problem. Uh, we have had some success, but not enough to sort of share with you. So these are the problems where it doesn't work is problems where you have a sort of a weak form of the residual, where the strong form of the residual is somehow does not reflect the errors in the problem. And there are many such problems, you know, multi-scale, multi-physics problems. But there are many problems which are not in this. If you have elasticity or uh, you know diffusion problems, uh, finance and so on, these problems pins works very very well for these problems. So there there is some understanding when it works and when it doesn't work. But this is really in its infancy. The first rigorous results were arguably ours, which was and these papers were in June. Mm -hmm. And some other people also came out with similar results around the time of June. So this is uh, really, really new, but there is potential. Thank you. Um, while maybe people are thinking about questions, there's another one I'd like to ask. Um, topic we didn't really touch upon much is uh, present in both um, unsupervised and unsupervised learning uh, hyperparameters. Yes. So, I, um, I, so hyperparameter tuning and optimization. Um, yes. So this is a very, very good question. Uh, hyperparameters are, as always, a big problem. Uh, here, I don't have any. Of course, I have a theory which says that if you train well, you sort of generalize well, right? But the the hyperparameters they come in into this training, and uh, in all the problems that we have done. We have done them in a systematic manner. You can look up the you can look up the codes, but uh, and papers, but we have not observed a big sort of sensitivity to hyperparameters. So, for instance, the loss function that you use, the optimizer that you use, there are small sensitivities, but this is like within five ten percent of the best results. You know, so there's not a huge mm -hmm. lot of sensitivity. The thing that is the most sensitive to both for supervised as well as for unsupervised learning is uh, sort of the when you have the stochastic gradient descent. Now you have to start somewhere, right? And uh, you have to initialize your weights and biases. Now in machine learning, different kinds of weights and biases have been uh, different initializations. There is this famous Gloro initialization, Hay initialization, and so on. This is the most sensitive. Uh, so you if you start with one initialization and you look at your minimum and then you look at what are the generalization properties of your minimum you might have a very very wrong picture mm -hmm. that's why if you look at my results i always gave a average and this or a mean and this was always over different starting points so and if you look at in the last picture that i had about tsunamis i had a histogram on the errors and this was precisely with respect to different starting points 
Mm-hmm. So in practice, you can do this in parallel, right? You can start with 10. 10 is a good number. <laughs> uh, you can start with 10 different uh, retrainings as this is called in the parlance. And then you look at your training error and the one with the lowest training error, you just do. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean that this will have the best general life. This is the most sensitive hyperparameter, as always in machine learning. This is the most sensitive. The other ones are not, not very sensitive. I see. Thank you. Let's see. Are there more questions? Um, final call, I would say. <laughs> Maybe I have a question. Can you can you hear me? Yes, very well. Yes. Um, Maybe uh, as a as a follow up to to this in initialization, so I see often machine learning uh, literature uh, reporting. Oh, there are the slides. I know it's the next. Okay, um, <laughs> reporting um, some uh, test error, but uh, they never mention whether they repeated the training run with different initialization. So just as you said. Uh, do you have a feeling from from your experience? What is what is the typical um, their variance between like this, if you say if uh, you do 10, 10 training runs or yes, fifty uh, or something? I wish I could uh, have a theorem about this, right? But this is something which goes deep into stochastic gradient descent, and I want to understand this, but I must confess that I haven't understood it very well empirically. I can tell you that uh, there is there is significant variance. If you look at my paper, which is in Journal of Computational Physics, we report that there is there is significant variance, and uh, so one uh, one should be careful about this. So either one takes an average, and in, indeed, just by repeating uh, runs, you can get completely different results. And yep. in machine learning literature, they are notorious for presenting the best results and never showing the worst results, right? Exactly. But so in the, scientific, scientific yeah. computing, our, uh, there are consequences. Uh, you cannot, <laughs> you cannot. So I think the best is to take an average or uh, some other statistic. And it turns out that the averages are not so bad. Uh, the best is to plot a histogram over that, right? Over the, but maybe that is not always yep. feasible. But this is, at the moment, it is still very empirical. Yeah. My experience is 10, then present the averages. And I don't like it when people in machine learning say that, uh, oh, I got 99.98% accuracy. And uh, <laughs> in another run, you get 85.32% accuracy, right? Yeah. And I think the problem is that in some ML problems, the the networks are so big that you can only, only yes. ever afford, if your training run runs like, 10 days on 100 GPUs. I agree. This is you take this is that, more. but yeah. but still, yeah. But what okay. we what we do is the biggest uh, biggest neural networks on scientific computing problems that we have run haven't had more than 100,000 parameters. Yeah, it's still expensive to train, but you know it uh, because you have to train for a lot of epochs, but. Uh, but I, I still insist always that uh, in our training phase, we, we do like five or 10, whatever is affordable, and we, we tell the variance. It's not a very good measure on the variance, but it's something, right? Yeah. I know there, there are people uh, from statistical physics uh, working on theories of yes. gradient descent and comparing this with uh, glass, I think glass models and stuff Absolutely. like that. So there is a, there is a lot there of is, but there's, there's no of, theory no. as of now. Yeah. There okay, is a lot thanks. Of, they, they can only measure things like uh, large deviations with respect to how many uh, saddle points are there or something like that. You know, they, they, no one at the moment can tell you what is the variance with respect to different initialization. And this is a really, really relevant question. Okay. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Okay. So if there aren't any further questions, I'd like to thank you, Siddhartha, again for giving us this uh, very insightful talk. I'd like to... You're most welcome. Thank you. And thank and you also, for the questions. It was very helpful. Yeah. I'd like to thank the audience, exactly, for all the questions and the discussion. And the conference will resume tomorrow at 4 p.m. with a talk by um, Louis Silva on kinetic plasma simulations at the exascale. 
and I wish everyone uh, a nice evening.